and the never-ending quest for speed on the world's most challenging road courses, high-tech. Glamour. Life in the fast lane and danger. Space-age racing machines manned by drivers of 11 nations, thrilling aficionados in 16 countries. But it was the island of Great Britain that delivered us one of motorsports' greatest champions, the wee Scott, Jackie Stewart. Three times a world driving champion, winner of an unprecedented 27 Grand Prix in 99 starts. But the old order changes. As the 1987 season dawned, Stewart's record of 27 was in jeopardy. At the opening competition in Brazil, France's favorite, Alain Pro, won to bring his career victory total to 26. The Grand Prix circus then moved across the Atlantic to the tiny principality of San Marino in northern Italy. But mechanical trouble, the ever-present worry of Grand Prix drivers, forced Prost out of the race early and made it a cakewalk for Britain's number one driver, Nigel Mansell. Two weeks later, in the World War II battleground of the Ardennes, Prost was at the top of his form and came home a winner in the Belgian Grand Prix, equaling Stewart's mark of 27. Then it was on to the Riviera and Monte Carlo, Prost's private property for three straight years. But mechanical gremlins left him ninth, as Brazilian Fuller Ayrton Senna was the driver who was entertained in the Royal Box by the Prince of Monaco. The motorized troubadours again crossed the Atlantic for their only race in North America, as Prost's quest for victory continues in a race he's never won. Through the winding streets of Motown, today, it's the sixth annual Detroit Grand Prix. On an on-again, off-again rainy day in Detroit, thousands of spectators are here for the Grand Prix, hoping the rain holds off for the race itself. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Economaki, wondering what kind of a track we're going to have for this important auto race, the only Formula One competition in North America, the Canadian round having been canceled. Despite the condition of the track, the big story today is whether or not the little Frenchman, Alain Prost, who's starting in the third row, can win today, and in so doing, eclipse the record set by the great Jackie Stewart. He matched that record in Belgium, and Jackie Stewart, the wee Scott, is now with Ken Squire, who'll call the race for us today. Jackie, you traveled to 99 races to establish that mark of 27 wins, and now you're back on the circuit with a different purpose. Well, now it's to keep an eye on Alan Prost, who obviously today could break that record and have 28 Grand Prix victories. Uh, he's a very good man to do the record, Ken. He's the best Grand Prix driver in the world today, maybe the best race driver in the world, and if he gets it, then I'll be the first to want to shake his hand. He, I only hope that he feels as it's as such an honor as I felt when I beat... Uh, Fangio and Jim Clark's records because it meant so much to me. Let's go back to 1973 and that last win. The Nürburgring in Germany when Jackie Stewart driving for Team Tyrrell came across the line in first place. Teammate Francois Sever in second that day. Jackie Ix was third. And let's recall one more time why you at 34 at that time still very much in your prime elected to step away. Well, I think I was pretty burned out as an individual. I just had had enough. But then Francois got killed at the Grand Prix in Watkins Glen just before on the qualifying day. And I suppose that put the final cap on it in a way. He was a good close friend. I thought he would be the next world champion, frankly, because I knew I was going to retire. But I think the sport had done a lot to me, had given me a lot, but also had taken a lot away from me in the sense of private time. And I just was burned out, Ken, really. Thank you very much. Three-time world champion Jackie Stewart. The man standing by with the defending world champion and a chance to break Stewart's mark today, Alain Prost, is down on pit road and we'll update that story with my colleague Dave Despain. Thank you, Ken, as Alain Prost confronts this possible rendezvous with history. He is not a happy man. The French world champion, the first Frenchman to win that title, is a perfectionist who fears today that perfection is beyond his grasp. There is the matter of the engine. The race motor broke last night. The crew worked until 4 a.m. replacing it. There is the weather. 
critical trassy adjustments have been changed and changed again as we've gone from wet to dry. At the very last possible moment, a shower of fuel out of the engine, a last-minute problem that has just now been solved. And so, Alain Prost, as he awaits the start of this race, has asked us not to be interviewed. He is alone with his crew, alone with his thoughts. Let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm here with Nigel Mansell, Britain's number one driver. Nigel, what about the track conditions? What kind of a start will we see? Well, hopefully a good one now, because uh, God bless America, the sun's coming out. <laughs> okay. With what's gone by past this season, would you rather have somebody alongside of you in the front row than Ayrton Senna, Nigel? Makes no difference, really. Um, I mean, all the drivers down, up and down the pit lane are all good professional drivers. Well, you look at tense. We hope you have a great drive. Thanks very much for chatting with us. And now up to Ken Squire in the booth. Thanks our co-driver for our 18 camera live telecast today, fresh from Le Mans, our good friend David Hobbs. And David, as you look at this two and a half mile, 20 turn track for two hours, it makes one think of a ski slalom run at 85 miles per hour with a thousand gates. Well, it certainly is like a uh, ski slalom, Ken, but a very, very painful one, of course, if you miss one of those gates. Yes, a thousand gates in under two hours, but of course, you've got the other complication of having to change gear in between those gates about 3,000 times, three and a half thousand times. Obviously, as well as that, of course, you've got 26 other runners in there, some of whom are going a lot slower than you, some of whom are going faster. And so one way or another, it's going to be a pretty dodgy afternoon. The weather this morning was very bad during their warm-up. It was wet and incredibly slippery through the streets of Detroit as the car number, uh, as we see the data general car there, proving down at the Atwater Tunnel. But it looks as if it's going to be dry and sunny this afternoon. Obviously, the worst conditions would be if they had a light shower just about halfway through, and that would get everybody's attention really cued in. But anyway, we're going to go back down to uh, Eddie Cheever, who is standing by with Dave Despain. Indeed, the only American in the race this afternoon, a man who finished second here in 1982, Eddie Cheever. Is this the day you improve that position by one? I sure hope it is. Uh, the USF&G Arrows is running well. We ran quite well in qualifying. It's going to be a very difficult race. The weather conditions are uh, a bit of a hazard because it sprinkles with a bit of rain now and then, so it's very difficult when you're running on slick tires. I think they have a good chance of finishing the top three. I think that would be a very positive result for us. Your team has been called the most improved in Formula One this year. Do you share that optimism about the future of this team? Absolutely. I mean, the backing we've had from USF&G has made a lot of difference. Uh, we're now capable of uh, programming farther ahead than they have done in the past. Uh, the Megatron engine is running well. We have a lot of work to do on the fuel consumption. This is one of those races where fuel consumption is not that important. Today's an important day for us. 26 international stars will go to the line. America's favorite son, Eddie Cheever, comes from sixth. Ken? We'll be back with the starting lineup shortly as today CBS brings you the highest level of technology in any sport face to face with the highest level of danger. Ladies and gentlemen, the starting lineup for the 1987 Detroit Grand Prix. On the pole, the 1986 world title runner-up from Great Britain in a Honda-powered Williams, Nigel Mansell. Starting second from Brazil, the Lotus Honda of defending Detroit Grand Prix champion, Ayrton Senna. Third, the two-time world champion and 1984 Detroit winner, also from Brazil, Nelson Piquet. A surprise in fourth, the Benetton Ford with Belgium's Thierry Boutsen. Going for win 28, Starting fifth, two-time and defending world champion for Team McLaren, Alain Prost of France. Sixth is the lone U.S. driver, second at Detroit in 82. Born in Phoenix, Arizona, Eddie Cheever. Seventh, the symbol of Italian motoring supremacy, the blood-red Ferrari of the 1983 Detroit winner, Michele Alboreto. Eighth, also from Italy, Teo Fabi, Indy 500 pole setter in 1983 with a Benetton Ford. Ricardo Patrese starts ninth for the Brabham BMW-powered team. Great Britain's Derek Warwick starts tenth, seeking his first Grand Prix victory. Swedish champion Stefan Johansson will guide the second McLaren from 11th. Austria's Gerhard Berger commences 12th in another 850-horsepower Ferrari. 13th is England's Dr. Jonathan Palmer in a Tyrrell Ford, fifth in his last outing at Monaco. 14th is the second Ken Tyrrell creation with Philippe Streff of France in the cockpit. Great Britain's Martin Brundle in the German-bred Zaxbeed is 15th. Zaxbeed teammate Christian Donner of Germany is 16th. 
17th is Italy's Andre de Cesare in a Brabham. The up-and-comer, Alessandro Nanini, is 18th in the Italian creation, the Minardi. 19th, the 23-year-old Alex Coffey in only his sixth start with the Alfa Romeo-powered Osella. Philip Alio of France is 20th in a Lola Ford. 21st is seven-time Grand Prix winner René Arnoux with the Ligier. 1985 Formula 3000 champion, Italy's Ivan Capelli in a March Ford is 22nd. Giancarlo Cinzani in the second Ligier is 23rd. 24th is Satoru Nakajima, the first Japanese driver to score world championship points. 25th is Spain's Adrian Campos. And 26, rounding out the field, Pascal Fabril, France, 26 starter. It is one of the most exacting courses in the 16 venues on which Grand Prix competes. Two and a half miles, 20 turns. Note that 90 Per, or to rather attend to those turns, 50% of them are 90 degree turns. There's three 180 degree corners here, and let's take a look now at what this course is all about with David Hobbs. Coming out of the pits, going up through the gears as it goes on to the fastest part of this two and a half mile racetrack. Approaching turn one at 170 miles down, a full lap into turn one, second gear. Application of power all the way around this corner, really start to lay on it here and go up through the gears. Second, third, fourth, maybe fifth, up to about 140 mile an hour down this short straight. A bit of an opportunity to pass as you brake really hard for this little right-hander, which leads you up the hill behind the Renaissance Center. A bit bumpy just at the bottom here as you go under the bridge. One shift up, back down a gear. Around that, clip that apex really close there. Up to a difficult part here to overtake. The road meanders left. There's no way you're going to get past anybody here who wants you to stay out. Left here, slightly left, and then it really tightens up here. More braking, down into second. A lot of power here as you go going through the Congress Park. Under the trees, the road sweeps right, sweeps left again. You want to make sure the car starts to go over to the right here as you brake really hard and go on to Beaubien Street, down to second gear. Hold on to second gear as you go left. Break again, right, onto the second part of the second fastest part of the track. This is Larned Street. Out of the light, into the tunnel, up to 145 miles an hour. Very, very bumpy here. Again, another place to pass here as you break into this left, right complex again. Second gear. Hold on to second. Turn right here. Accelerate very hard down this next straightaway. 145 miles an hour down here. Up to fifth gear. Again, very bumpy. Sharp left-hand turn here by the Cobo Hall. Going down Civic Center Drive. Now the road again goes left, left again, downhill, right, under the bridge. Stay in one gear here. Squirt it here from second, maybe up to third. Down to first, the slowest corner on the track. Really hard acceleration here. First, second, third, fourth, fifth as you go under the Atwater Tunnel. Very confusing as you go out of the really bright light into the pitch dark and back to bright sunshine again. Braking hard alongside the car park here behind the hotel. Right, left, very bumpy this left-hander. Throws you out to that right-hand wall, but it's also bumpy by the wall. Fastest part of the course coming up. A wicked left over the curb there. Right, left chicane. Extremely fast, 130 miles an hour. As the car accelerates up to fifth or even sixth gear, and the car reaches 170 miles an hour as it goes past the start-finish line. The preliminary lap. Coming up St. Antoine Street here in Detroit, Michigan, live on CBS. We're getting set for the start. 26 car field, 63 laps. This preliminary lap is a counting lap for two hours, whichever comes first, the distance of this event. There's the Renaissance Center in Detroit. The mark, the signature of power, the new power of the city of Detroit. Previous winners in this event. It goes back to 1982 when John Watson came from 17th to win it. And then in 1983, Michele Alboreto, then driving for Team Tyrrell, drove a normally aspirated car to victory. The last time that we saw one of those normally aspirated machines in victory lane here at Detroit. Last year, it was Senna, victorious. He's trying to be the first repeat winner. The formation lap, of course, is really just to warm the tires, warm the engines, warm the gearboxes up. They'll then form up on the grid and they'll be there for the absolute minimum amount of time they get to completely reform on the grid. They obviously have to wait for the last car to join on the back. 
And at that stage, we'll get the red light, which will last for no more than 10 seconds. And then, of course, they get the green light. No flags in uh, Formula One racing, just the lights. And that magnificent sound as all of these engines of just immeasurable value all come to life at once from the standing start. It is an amazing moment. At this point, if you want to worry, you can worry about the lack of visibility, the claustrophobic sensation of the concrete barriers from which you must run inches away around this track for some two hours. The slower cars on this track, the manhole covers, the man sitting to your right, the man in back of you, the car in front of you, and the weather today, very much a factor, and very much you have to worry about the car in which you have invested your own life. Well, of course, <coughs> there we see the weather today, which is uh, pretty humid, as you can see. The temperature certainly feels more than 68, and I know it'll be feeling more than 68 to those drivers out there, and of course, there's a strong possibility of a shower. Field moving online. Mansell on the pole for the eighth time in his career, fourth time this season, seeking his eighth Grand Prix win. 17th time he's been in the front row. Ayrton Senna, 22nd time in his career that he's been in the front row, seeking his sixth win today. Cars are now under the instructions of the clerk of the course from San Francisco, Roger Iani, a 25-year veteran. Safety crews getting ready. Roland Ranchorada of Belgium will be the starter. Field coming up, they'll all pull into position here, 26 strong, largest field we've seen at Detroit, and in a moment, the magic of Formula One. Terry Boots in that fourth spot, probably feeling more nervous than anybody. That's the furthest he's been up on a Formula One grid there. You see the lights in the bottom right-hand corner. Under starter's orders. Watching the gantry. And we have commenced the 1987 Detroit Grand Prix. First, second, third gear. And jumping out in front, Nigel Mansell takes the lead. Senna dropping to second. Somebody went wide, they're going to turn one. Very wide and falling back, but I don't believe off the course. Mansell making a superb start. In fact, a very, very clean start from this big 26-car field. From Nakajima's camera in the rear of the field as he tries to cut through. Remember, he started well back. Oh, he's run, he's run over the back wheel of the, uh, the Leighton House March. This is Nakajima from the back of the field, trying to work his way through in the early going. Remember, he started 24th. We'll be following that Lotus, Honda Power, once again here this year. Honda showing their power, and for the fifth time this year, they have entirely taken the front row. A spin here. That is Nakajima. And Nakajima's in trouble. He may have caused some damage when he ran over the back of that uh, normally aspirated Mars. They just pushed him back a bit. Back, like... He had a tremendous run in the rain this morning. Here he is backing the car up. We can look at it in replay. Trying to get underway. Coming into Congress. We're coming into Congress Center here. The Ocella directly in front of him. Well, I don't know what he did there. He banged the tail end of the car and sent him across the track. Let's take a look at another angle. Oh, he got banged oh. by another car. Banged in the rear by one of the Minardi cars. That's the car that went into turn one very wide, I think. Leaders at the end of lap number one. Through the chicane. Out in front is Manchel. Senna is in second. PK is in third. Eddie Cheever in fourth. Back they go to turn one, this time at 165 miles an hour. They roll it down under this horseshoe, through the gears, and there you see the interval between Great Britain's Nigel Mansell, 1,000 horsepower in this 1,150-pound turbo car. But with a pop-off valve, it brings it down, they hope, to around 800 horsepower, an effort to somewhat curb the tremendous power of these cars. Well, both of these engines, of course, uh, the Honda, engine in both of these cars and they really both of these drivers putting a tremendous stamp of authority on this race at the end of this first lap and a half a bit of a replay thus far of the opening of monaco the last event out they started this way and as you'll recall mansell ran half the distance and had trouble senna went home the victor in that event let's go to chris economy
on the formation lap, when the cars went around very slowly to get their positions on the grid, Ayrton Senna's Lotus hooked the manhole cover, and it disturbed the left front corner of the car's under tray. Some frantic repairs were made just before the race got underway, and then the Lotus pit there wondering whether those repairs will hold. Back to you, Ken. We see a safety vehicle also on the track as they go by Cobo Hall. Headed for the tunnel. Mansell first. Here is Senna in second. And here is the interval now dropping back to third position. Where you find Nelson Piquet of Brazil. Nelson Piquet being harried there by Eddie Cheever, who on the grid, speaking to Dave Despain, said that he would be very happy if he had a top four finish. And boy, he's right there. There's one of the Benetton cars. Eddie Cheever, of course, had his best finish of all time right here in Detroit back in 1982 when he placed second. There's Cheever worrying PK as they come to the chicane. They come right by us. We are located directly at the chicane, and they come out of it at about 75, 80 miles an hour here. That's put in to slow them down or their optimum speed as they would go to turn one to be over 200 miles an hour. Tremendous crowd has turned out, although the weather has been anything but favorable here in Detroit today. You're watching it live on CBS, the 1987 Detroit Grand Prix. Nigel Mansell, the British driver, who broke his neck, broke his back, they said would never race, was picked up by Team Lotus, went on, had great success as a test driver for them, was allowed to compete, and then was replaced by Ayrton Senna of Brazil. And some say that's where the bad blood began between the two. Well, he's certainly uh, making a tremendous dash in these first few laps of this race. Fuel consumption is not going to be a problem through the city streets here. It's not a fuel consumption circuit. And he's gradually pulling away from Senna, and both of them are really pulling away from the field. There you see Cheever making a tremendous run on PK and then the Benetton right behind them. That Benetton behind them, in fact, is T.O. Babby, pole sitter at Indianapolis. And in fact, he's really duffed up his teammate, Thierry Boots, who started fourth, who's dropped back to about ninth. Look at this move, Eddie Cheever. Nice. Out breaking PK. Nice move there. You could just see the plumes of smoke coming off Cheever's wheels. Not quite long, but just enough to smoke. We saw a safety car coming by and it pulled onto pit road. There was no caution to the track. It came down the track. For a moment, we thought we might have an incident somewhere. That is not the case. So Cheever pulls himself in. Oh, the here we see another position. pass. Tio Fabi going past the Ferrari there into that very tight little complex just before the main straight here. Teo Fabi has been sick for the last three days. He did not qualify well at all. Has not been feeling well, but he sure looks like he's got it all gathered up today. Nelson Piquet into the pits. Number six, the previous winner of this race, 1984 winner, into the pits. So that is a great shame. There he is, Piquet. Just coming in and coming right back out again. Maybe a tire equalizer. I don't know what was wrong, but... Uh, He's got a long, hard way to go back now as he's dropped to absolutely dead last. There he comes out with the last place car. The March, the turquoise-colored car, and the Yosella, the Alfa Romeo-powered machine just in front of him. Nelson Piquet trying to fight his way back into this event. Theo Fabi doing extremely well. There we see uh, Terry Boats, and here's, here's our leader again, Nigel Mansell. Showers of sparks coming off. Those sparks are really nothing important. They're titanium rub strips they have underneath the car. One car, that is the uh, Osella that's off the course. He must be off the course at turn three, I think. One of the back markers in the field having trouble. Let's go to Nelson Piquet's pit quickly. Okay, in uh, Nelson Piquet's pit, we can see here a puncture being written on the tire that caused him to come in the pits right here. It's leaving the former world champion in the last position. He's got quite a drive ahead of him. He's a very thin skin tires and on a street course with people all around throwing debris around. There is some debris out there that can cause a puncture such as this. Back to you, Ken. The standings as we get two into the fourth lap would be Mansell in first, Senna in second, Chiva third, Nelson Piquet is fourth, Tio Fabi in fifth, Michele Alvareto is sixth, Prost is seventh, Thierry Boots in eighth, Gerhard Berger ninth, and it would be Derek Warwick in tenth. And here you see Eddie Cheever in the Aeros car. John Schmidt of the Detroit area, the man putting the engines together now for this car. And actually, they're old BMW engines called Megatrons. These are the same four-cylinder engines that, in fact, won this race in 1984 
uh, in the BMW Brabham and Eddie Jeeva going extremely well. They are very powerful engines. These are some of your 900 horsepower jobs. They're no little wimpish engine. <laughs> and uh, it's a powerful engine. Obviously, uh, Nelson Piquet was having trouble in the number six Williams Honda. The Chiva's hanging right in there, but boy, uh, the other two, Nelson, that's the Ferrari of Alvaretto and Alain Prost McLaren, followed very closely by Thierry Bootsen in the green and yellow Benetton as they come through the Congress Park area. Teo Fabi has moved from eighth into fourth. That's the major move that we've seen thus far, pulled off by Fabi. And poor old Thierry Bootsen, the other one, has moved from fourth back to about ninth. Now we see Fabi closing on the American, born in Phoenix, Arizona, Eddie Cheever has spent most of his life in Rome, now lives in Monte Carlo, and Eddie Cheever is trying to fend off the attack that is being waged in this early going by Italy's Teo Fabi with a Ford turbo powered car. Notice how low it is in the back. That's that small turbo Ford engine that develops such incredible horsepower and you feel like you could put it under your arm and take it home. Well, it is a very, very, very compact power unit, incredibly compact. Of course, all these turbo power units are going to be obsoleted in the next 18 months when we go to the normally aspirated cars and some of the teams like Tyrrell have jumped the gun. There's the computer that's taking in the material on this race, one of many computers along Pit Road. No longer is it just a matter of getting out a stopwatch and showing up with a bag of tools. Here's Fabi closing at turn one, moving in on Cheever. These are 1,150-pound cars. Average car in America may be 60 horsepower. You're watching 800 to 1,000 horsepower each in these two machines. There's Nakajima walking back. No, that's not Nakajima, that's uh, Alex Cappy, I think. Alex Cappy from the Osella car. Yeah. Now, these two guys, that Tio Fabi is really setting Eddie Cheever up here. He seems to me to be quicker. I think if he got round Eddie Cheever, he'd be able to pull away from him. It but, of course, getting around is a different thing. Immense pressure on these four drivers to do well here today as they are performing in Detroit. And they've really geared up for this battle, particularly the Benetton team. Absolutely. Edsel Ford will be here, as will a lot of other Ford people, in the various suites and in the pits. Kinzani has just pitted back on the track. There's the leader, Nigel Mansell, slamming that Williams Honda-powered car around this track. Frank Williams, paralyzed, sitting in a wheelchair almost directly across from us, hoping to see his car win its 33rd Grand Prix victory here today. Back to that Cheever battle. And it's oh, and there's the Ferrari. Uh, Alan Prost in the McLaren there. The red and white car tried to have a go around that pure red Ferrari, but just didn't quite pull it off. Under the first bridge, which but goes Prost beneath the uh, highway. Now they come to the outwater tunnel. A very, very close race there for four, well, through 12th or 13th place. Tio Fabi, I mean, Thierry Bootsen having a go now at Alain Prost, the current world champion. This is the best that Thierry Bootsen's had for a long time. He must have made an awful start somewhere, but he qualified well and well, is going well now. He qualified fourth and fell back immediately. Bootsen in the black helmet, yellow and red piping. There's the leader, drawing away. This is Nigel Mansell. Don't forget those dramatic pictures taken in Dallas as he collapsed trying to push his car to the finish line. We'll be, well, we have an incident here on the track, we're being told. Ah, uh, yes, the nose is off from Fabi's car. Oh, Tio Fabi, what a shame. He was going so well. Now, ooh, now he's blocking everybody as he goes up into the Congress area. Let's take a look at what happened to Tio Fabi's automobile. Oh, Eddie he's trying Cheever. to get round Eddie Cheever here as they break into turn three. And I suppose uh, we'll see that Eddie Cheever wasn't going to have anything of it. No, exactly. There we go, and there goes the nose. Uh, in theory, I'm afraid to say that really was Cheever's corner because he was, was still well in front. Well in front. Um, on the other hand, still very unfortunate for uh, Tia Fabi. So they picked up the nose and they're reporting that Cheever has slowed some since that moment. Well, he could have punctured his tyre, but it looked as if he really hit the front of the nose there with his tyre, which probably didn't do much damage to his car. Fabi should be pitting right here to take on a new nose on that car. Aerodynamics are absolutely destroyed. There's just no way you can drive on this track in that condition. No, even on a slow circuit, a relatively slow circuit like this one, uh, those front wings just make a tremendous difference. 
157 miles the distance. We are now working the seventh of 63 laps in green flag condition. Bobby holding on there. You see the nose of the car where the nose should be. His feet just behind that wall there, part of the braking system that you can see on the front of the car. Mansell stays in front. Nigel Mansell's absolutely decimating this field. I mean, he's pulling away at the most horrific rate. Well, he better pray that car is bulletproof as he slams it around this course. There is no margin for error. It's one of the most difficult courses in Formula One. If you miss here, you're in a wall. And there is no recouping from those kinds of situations. Well, I mean, he's obviously driving. There we see uh, Fabi having his new nose put on. Or they'll be thinking about putting one on, I guess. Here's Dave Despain. Tail of Bobby's car on pit road, the nose cone missing, the engine has been shut Eddie down. Eddie G on pit lane they too, Eddie G. They quickly to try to raise up the car on the jacks, then the crew official said no, and now Bobby has climbed from the automobile. Tail of Bobby climbing out there apparently is more to the story than just the missing nose cone. As Tail of Bobby has pulled off, Tail, Tail, what happened? Well, Chiva was very slow, but he didn't want to let me by, so I had a little accident. Is there more to the problem than just the nose cone, obviously? Do you know what else is wrong with the car? Uh, no, just the nose. So the nose cone is gone, and Teo has climbed out. However, he climbed out with that terminal look in his eye, and I suspect that car is parked for the day. Ken? And David, Eddie Cheever pitted just at the same time. He came in to work on the, on the Arrows car, so there was a problem on that machine as well. There's the leader, Nigel Mansell, staying in front in our live coverage of the Detroit Grand Prix. We'll be back with more live coverage of this Detroit event after this message and a word from your local station. We're back with you live from Detroit, Michigan. Here are the standings after 10 laps complete. Nigel Mansell of Great Britain is in first. Then the brilliant Brazilian Ayrton Senna maintains second. Michele Alboreto has taken the Ferrari into third. Thierry Mutsa now has the Benetton Ford in fourth. And the man looking for his 28th and new record for victories in Formula One Grand Prix racing, Prost, is lying fifth on the field. There's the leader, and you can see them still throwing sparks as they begin to lighten up those fuel loads. That won't be quite as noticeable, David. The sparks will go away as the car gets lighter. They just drag along the floor. One of the things to remember as you watch these turbo-powered cars, the fuel they use is much denser than what are used in the Tyrol cars, which are normally aspirated. Weighs about 8% more. It's extremely heavy fuel, so when these cars load up with 50-odd uh, U.S. gallons of gas, uh, they do carry a lot of weight at the start line, even though the cars themselves, of course, are very, very light. Let's bring you up on some other stories within the race. Nelson Piquet has come back to 13th. Capelli has pitted, and Dr. Jonathan Palmer has lost one lap. Working lap 12 now as you watch Nigel Mansell. And here's a good battle as we watch Michele Alvaretto in the number 27 car with Thierry Bootsen beginning to worry him at turn number one. Thierry Bootsen's trying to gain back that time he lost at the start and that we didn't see what happened. But he's giving old Alvaretto a good run for his money. Alvaretto also a previous winner of this race. Bootsen, so smooth, who has come up in the shadow of Jackie Ix in Belgium. He has not received the acclaim that Ix received, but he's certainly working on it. And any kind of a good finish here today, as this event is being televised live to 34 countries around the world, they're certainly watching in Belgium, which do well for Bootsen's. Absolutely. Uh, Thierry Bootsen is, is a national hero in Belgium. He hasn't quite reached the status yet of Jackie Ix, but he's certainly getting there very, very quickly. Ooh, nice and close to the wall there as he goes on to Larned Street. Using Penny Road there in the picture at the frame at the back was uh, Alain Prost, the current world champion, who is dropping back from this dueling uh, duo here. I, do, I guess you've noticed as the cars reach high speed, the uh, humid air is compressed by those wings and you're getting tremendous vortexes of uh, atmosphere off the edge of those wings or water vapor off the edges of those wings. You see it there on the Canon car. Leader lapping cars as we, he's that's lapping the uh, AGS car. Right, that's Fabre he was lapping. Nigel's got about a six second lead already on second man. And uh, Piquet, his teammate, is now up to 12. Piquet, of course, is going to make a lot of ground until he starts coming up against people like uh, Berger in the Ferrari. It may be a tad inclement, but there, I believe there is a record crowd here in Detroit. 
to see this Grand Prix. And what a magnificent week it has been here. It has become a Mardi Gras festival that Bob McCabe and company have put on. And right now we continue to watch what everyone here has their eyes galvanized to. That's Nigel Mansell's car leading by several seconds over the first active suspension car in the race. Here's that battle back in third and fourth place another time. Michele Alvarado directly behind him. Green gold colors and several others of the Benetton. Ayrton Senna's Lotus Honda continues to run in the second position here today. It qualified second for today's race and maintains that position at this hour. And it has somewhat of an advantage on this very bumpy Detroit Grand Prix course. Chris Economaki tells us why. I'm standing beside the most advanced racing machine the sport has ever known. It's the Honda engine Camel Lotus 99. And one of the reasons it deserves that description because it's the only car racing today with a hydraulically actuated, computer-controlled, active suspension system as opposed to a passive suspension system. The heart of the system is this digital computer located underneath the driver's seat. If the computer is the brain of the system, then the eyes, ears, and sense of touch are sensors, 18 of them located at strategic suspension points, and a pair of pitot tubes on the nose that measure air coming in. The pitot tube is found on an airplane and tells the pilot how fast his plane is going through the air. At all four corners of the car, and we're here at the left rear now, is a hydraulic actuating strut with a control unit on top. After the computer has received all the information from the 18 sensors and the two pitot tubes, it tells each corner of the car whether it should be higher or lower. Hydraulic pressure is provided by this pump on the exhaust cam of the left-hand engine bank. Now, what does it all mean? Well, aerodynamics, as evidenced by the wings on the car, is a very important part of racing today. And for a car to be aerodynamically perfect, the ride height must be constant. So the active suspension system maintains a standard ride height. The car is going very fast down a straightaway. Air rushing over the winds presses it too close to the ground. In slow corners, it's too far off the ground. The active suspension system corrects all that. Here's a very interesting demonstration provided to the courtesy of one of the Lotus team members who's blowing into the pitot tube to simulate the car going faster through the air. You can see what happens to the suspension as he does that. The computer monitors 87 parameters. In fact, on one lap of the Detroit Grand Prix course, two and a half miles, the computer makes 100 million calculations. Will we see it on our pleasure cars in this country? They tell me to look for the 1990 Corvette. And there was a Mercure on display around Detroit this week that also was looking toward active suspension, a one-off. I'm sure that we'll see it on all passenger cars within the next 10 years. And actually, they believe that is the uh, March car, number 16, Ivan Capelli in trouble and out of the race. And here is Derek Warwick in serious trouble, making his 73rd run. No, that's, that's Eddie T. Right? Uh, no, no, it's Derek Warwick. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Warwick, right. With the blue and white helmet yeah. for Team Eros, and oh, he's got problems. That's what you call a rear wheel derange. That is French for broken wheel. Crab-like down into the pits goes Derek Warwick. So one of the arrows is out. John Schmidt and Jackie Oliver will be a little concerned about that as they hope to get it home. Nigel Mansell won't be the least bit concerned. In the last three laps, his lead's gone from just under six seconds to just over 12. I mean, the man is really eating up this track. Here's Chris Economaki. We're in the USF and Chief and Derek Work has come in with a right rear wheel askew. It looks like a rear suspension arm is broken, and I would have to say that this car is pretty much out of it unless they can replace that part. Tools are being thrown down here, a whole toolbox full of tools, and apparently they're going to try and fix the car. Unlike American racing, there are 17 pit crew members working on this car right now. He'll be in for a good while as he turns off the engine. Back to you, Ken. Nelson P.K. is pulled into the ninth position. There's Michele Alboreto, who is maintaining third at this time. 83.9 mile an hour average on this two and a half mile, 20 turn course. It's Detroit, live on CBS, the Grand Prix. Here's Dave Despain.
The problems for Derek Warwick, the second for this Arrows team here. Eddie Cheever's earlier problem that prompted the pit stop was the result of a punctured tire. They have replaced the tire, obviously, and he was quickly back out onto the racetrack. Warwick will be here much longer. Elsewhere, Jonathan Palmer's problem was the result of a suspension failure. A part in the rear suspension broke. Palmer was in for a matter of a couple of minutes and then returned to the racetrack. He is in that normally aspirated as opposed to turbocharged class, and we'll be talking more about that as the afternoon goes on. One other retirement from the race, Andre de Cesaris of the Brabham team. Brabham had a problem this morning with the ignition on Ricardo Patrese's car. They fixed it. They said, ah, we don't know if this car is going to last very long. We may be the first guys out today. Instead, it was de Cesaris, the first car to drop out of the race today, and his problem was a broken gearbox. Ken? 14 laps complete, David, and here is Nelson Piquet now in ninth position and closing on Ricardo Patrese's Brabham BMW-powered car. Closing pretty fast, too. Nelson Piquet, who had trouble, as Chris Economaki reported, deflated tire, got it punctured out here. Here he is in turn number one, looking for Patrese to pick himself up another spot. Let's remind you, if you're following Formula One for the first time, that only six automobiles score world championship points in one of these events. It's nine points for the victory, six points for second, four, three, two, and one. So to move into the top six is serious business here. Thierry Bootson seems to be dropping back a little bit here, and Alan Prost has wheeled him in again, and also been wheeled in by uh, Gerard Berger in that Ferrari there, Ferrari number 28. I wonder what's happened to Thierry, because he seems to have lost touch with Alboreto, who he was giving a hard time to just a few minutes ago. Prost, such an immaculate driver, has such sympathy for his car, he never overuses it, and will watch his actions throughout this contest to see if he can bring it up to win number 28 today. The Detroit Grand Prix continues live on CBS. And we're back with you live, watching Ricardo Patrese, two-time Grand Prix winner in his 149th start, trying to fend off two-time world champion, Nelson Piquet of Brazil in the Williams Honda-powered car. Here's Piquet closing in on it. That interval was about three and a half seconds, and Piquet has done just an incredible job here of making up time. He has just been recorded with the fastest lap in the race for the chicane. There you see Riccardo Patrese, the great Italian driver, 33 years of age, trying to fend off PK, 17 times a winner. And there, right in front of them, I saw Stefan uh, jo Johansson's car slowing down. He's just in front of them now in the picture. Gearbox problem, I would believe, on that car. Here comes that battle. Well, he thought he'd have a go. Now, that's where we've seen two other drivers, a bit braver than that, have a go and got themselves stung for their trouble, but not Nelson Piquet, just taking a bit more time over. The McLaren of Stefan Johansson in seventh, Patrese in eighth, Piquet in ninth, and Johansson in the tag McLaren, one of the Ron Dennis cars, world championship team. is about to be passed. About to get passed here in big order. And, and there goes here. Nelson down the inside. Oh, well done. I'm not sure I'd have done that with uh, Ricardo Patrese. He's just inclined to be a bit blind on some times like that. Stefan Johansson slowed up a lot, but he's still going a fair clip. I wonder what is wrong with it. Now slowing down dramatically. Mm -hmm. Just to let them through, I think. So, so PK goes, to goes by Patrese. Picks off Johansson. And Nelson PK is now just outside of scoring points. He is in seventh position. Martin Brundle has pitted his automobile. Brundle on pit road briefly. One pit stop expected in this event. Yes, of course. Now, Nelson Piquet did change that one tire. Uh, obviously, it was too early for him to change it all, but they will all stop to make a tire change. There we see the leader back uh, lapping some of the slower cars. Dave to Spain. We're in Martin Brundle's pits, and we're covered with fire extinguisher smoke here. Brundle was in the process of making what appeared to be a routine tire stop. When he came in, flames erupted from the rear of the engine compartment. They were quickly extinguished. Then they had to shut down the engine. They had completed the tire change by that point, but I think the fire was significant enough to cause damage. So now the bonnet is coming off. A significant amount of flame there for a few minutes, but now they are in the repair mode here as uh, the activity is continuing down at the other end of the pit road with Chris Economaki. I'm in the McLaren pit where Stefan Johansson's car is getting a new nose put on it. 
They've just taken the original nose off. They're pushing him right alongside of us. There's any number of men here, and as you can see, the Zeus fasteners, a half a turn in the body work come off, and we're right on top of the action here. The car is covered with oil, apparently more than the nose needs working on as they're going to the engine room now. As a tall Swedish driver sits in here patiently waiting. The car's been stripped bare. They're working on the black box, the electronic engine control unit. It looks like they're going to change that. These boys really do big repair work, and Johansson is explaining to his crew members what the trouble seems to be. You can see the gesticulations there as he waits as the time ticks away, and car after car goes by the position, moving him further, further back in the standing. It'll be a while, so let's go back now to Ken Squire. These cars, so tiny, so delicate, so powerful. And look at this machine here, which continues to stomp through the field. That is Nelson P.K. now being shown in seventh position and closing on Gerhard Berger. Here are your top six. Nigel Mansell is leading, Senna second, Al Barreto third, Bootson fourth, Frost is fifth, Gerhard Berger's Ferrari is sixth, Nelson P.K. in the Williams Honda is in seventh. Remind you again that no driver has ever repeated in victory lane here at Detroit. P.K. trying to straighten that matter out. P.K. will be trying to straighten it out. He's 24 seconds behind Berger. Nigel Mansell has a massive 17 and a half second there. We see Nigel uh, going down there past the Cobalt Hall. Nigel Man there. That white flag there, that means there's a slow car in front. Now, they need that badly because they're about to go into the blackness of this tunnel. And as you see these cars, ah, there is the number nine car in trouble. That is the Brundle car, which was just in here a moment ago. The Zack Speed car. Is that the Brundle? Was it the Brundle car in the pits or was it the uh, Christian Danner car? Christian Danner car Christian was in Danner the pits. Car was in Martin, Martin Brundle's Brundle one is out here. So now we've got yellow flags and... Um, Just Martin below Brundle. our announce position. A pensive Martin Brundle. I see obviously out for the day. Um, as I was saying, Mansell's got a tremendous lead, nearly 20 seconds on Ayrton Senna. And uh, Berger's got a 25 second lead on Nelson Piquet, so Piquet's going to have his work cut out to catch up. He's certainly going to have his work cut out to win this race. Nigel Mansell continues to lead as the laps move by, running the 19th lap. Back with more live coverage from Detroit after this. So with 20 of the 64 laps complete, Mansell continues in first. Ayrton Senna second, Michele Alvarado's Ferrari third, but about to be challenged by Alain Prost of France. Then Thierry Boutsen, the Benetton Ford, maintaining the fifth position just outside in six is Gerhard Berger. Now there's the number one car. That is Alain Prost, who is ready to challenge the number 27. There you see the Ferrari. And that is Michele Alvarado. Alvarado, the winner of the second Grand Prix run here in Detroit, at that time driving for Team Tyrrell. And being severely wound in here by little Alain Prost, who is one of the calmest men on the Grand Prix scene, but I would say the, well, unarguably the best overall driver here. Although today Nigel Mansell's putting on a splendid show, I think overall terms Alain Prost is the current Grand Prix driver showing his class today. Meanwhile, back in the field, uh, we know that Nelson Piquet is hauling all this group in at about two seconds a lap. And there's a long way to go, which means he'll cl close up a lot. But of course, it's asking a lot for him to try and win this race. We may be watching a new record established in world championship racing. Jackie Stewart and the man at number one are tied with 27 career victories each. Frost is closing right now on Michele Alvaretto for third position. The Porsche tag-powered McLaren car is right there in the fourth spot. In third, you see the red Ferrari. That is Michele Alboreto. Here they are coming for St. Antoine Street. Closing again comes the McLaren up to within a car length. Very quick part of the course. On to Edgewood, about to cross Chrysler. Then just a brief moment on Larned, on to Congress. Better than 90 miles an hour right here, up to 110, 120. And remember, they're shifting those five and six speed boxes each lap. How many times, David? Well, they reckon they make about 55, 50 to 55 gear shifts per lap. Miss one and you stove up your engine. 
depending of course on the power band of the engine the gear ratio is chosen and so on and so forth but around about 50 gears just a lap 3,000 to race anyway now down Woodward on to Jefferson coming for Cobo Hall Alvaretto staying there and closing is Prost Alvaretto uh, at the moment probably slightly holding up Alan Prost if Prost got round him he'd probably pull away it's hard to tell they're both going very fast they're both being pulled in by Nelson Piquet who's just done another set another record lap here at 1 minute 44 seconds which is about 88 miles an hour Michele Alvareto has five victories to his credit here they come through the chicane and as they come out of the chicane a chance for that McLaren tag. There's Michele Alvaretto in third. And there's Prost that is running in the fourth position. Blue is running in fourth. We'll keep following this battle. Let's look at attrition for just a moment. These are the cars that thus far have fallen by the wayside. Nakajima out as he erected the very first lap. Mechanical problems on Campos, on Coffee. Bobby getting banged up in a crash with Cheever. Cheever falling a lap bound. Ivan Capelli's march having mechanical problem and quitting, and Brundle is out of the race. Dave Despain is with Martin Brundle. Let's find out what this track is like. Moments ago, we saw him engulfed in uh, flame and fire extinguisher stuff, and now he's out of the race with, what was the problem, Martin? Uh, we've got a blown turbocharger. At a scary moment there. I'm wondering about the racetrack. There's been so much talk and so much concern about Detroit track conditions. How is it? Well, it's good. It's the same for everybody. You know, we all go around the same track and you have to make the best of it. We're supposed to be the best drivers in the world, as I've said before. So uh, I find that the track is very demanding, but uh, having said that, Formula One cars are not really designed for this type of track. But nonetheless, here we are. We're pleased to be here. And unfortunately, it's not my weekend. Any deterioration of the new pavement that they put down out there? Deterioration of? Of the new pavement, the new paved section. Not that I can see. Martin Brundle out of the race, blown turbocharger the problem, Ken? Well, you saw the attempt being made by Cross to take that position away for Alvaretto. The scrap is for third position. He certainly had a go, but it wasn't uh, going to be his moment just right then, but I'm sure he'll have a few more goes before the afternoon's out to liven it up for all of us viewers. Uh, Martin Brundle was there very forth right there and a sense, the sort of thing that I've often felt myself, that a racetrack is a racetrack and it's no good completely whinging about the track. You have to make the best of it that you can on the day and with the conditions prevailing. Cross number one could have won his 28th Grand Prix at Monaco, but from early in that race, there were wisps of smoke from his usually reliable Porsche tag engine. From there, it was a slow death at Monaco. Today, he's in fourth, challenging for third. More in a moment. We're back. Formula One action today. Winston Cup stock cars at Michigan on the two mile next Sunday, live on CBS. Continuing to follow this battle as Nigel Mansell treats Detroit as if he were the mayor, the battle can further back in the field continues at a tremendous pace, and we're focusing on that. There you see the second Ferrari that's pulled into this picture. The picture is this. Alvaretto, number 27. Number one, Cross, and then number 28 stays right there trying to move through. And that number 28 car is Gerhard Berger, the Austrian driver, who is now becoming a factor as he's ready to challenge Alain Prost. Well, he's one of the best up-and-coming young drivers in Formula One racing today. And there goes Alain Prost, down Alvaretto, and so does his teammate. Slowing down, you Alvaretto's, can see Alvaretto yeah. lift his hand. Something was missed there. I think his tires have gone off. His tires look very bad to me in that last shot going through the Atwater hairpin. I could be wrong, but they looked a bit brave, but he didn't pit. He did not come in. He had the opportunity right there to drop on pit road, and he elected not to. Now Berger is giving uh, Alain Prost, the world champion, a pretty good run for his money. The position has been changed. So, this moves Prost into third position. Gerhard Berger moves to fourth. I'm not so sure, but when El Moreno was falling even further back here. Cheever is now up to 11th. Eddie Cheever is returning into the fray. Meanwhile, back with the leader, Nigel Mansell continues just so flawlessly around this track, and it's such an incredible mark. 84.644 was the average through 20 laps. We're now at 25 complete. The race record here set uh, in uh, uh, whatever it was is 84.9, so he's pretty close to that record, race record. 
Here's Prost number one, and directly behind him comes another of those red Ferraris trying to make his way through the field. Gerhard Berger. Berger has only one Formula One win, that in Austria back in 1984. Gerhard Berger won the Mexican Grand Prix oh, you're right. last, year. last year. Right, he ran his first race in 84. Right. First race was in 84. Now, Nigel's only got an 18-second lead over Senna. Uh, so it's absolutely leveled off there. I don't know whether that's significant or whether uh, Nigel Mansell just feels that he's got enough lead and that's all he needs. Nigel just did a lap in 143-1. 143.1 is uh, not exactly hanging around. That is about 87 and a half miles an hour. Cross third, Senna second, Mansell first. 26 complete. Now, uh, Nelson Piquet is right on the tail now of Thierry Bootsen, and he is catching up with that set third place car of Alan Prost. He's only about 12 seconds behind now. Now there's the 27 Ferrari of Alvaretto pitting. Mansell has the new fastest lap in the race as we see Alvaretto bring the Ferrari onto pit road. They don't seem in much of a hurry no, they don't, to do work they? on that. Here is their ton setup with the active suspension car that Chris O'Connor was explaining to you. Actually, we saw active suspension back in 1983 when Nigel Mansell had a Lotus with active suspension. They ran several races, but it was a little heavy and cumbersome, and now with new technology, it looks real serious. Running second, Ayrton Senna trying to win Detroit for the second straight year. This Detroit Grand Prix summary is brought to you by Quaker State, reaching for the best. Here's a summary of how things have gone through 60 of the 64 laps. With a total of 40 miles complete at that time, Nigel Mansell was first, Ayrton Senna second. This was a quarter breakdown. Michele Alvaretto then was third, Thierry Bootsen was fourth, fifth was Prost, and sixth was Berger. That was when they had finished one-fourth of the distance to be accomplished here today. Now take a look at how things are. Mansell has stayed up in front. He's been commanding this race since the outset. Senna stays in second. Prost has whipped through the field into third position. Gerhard Berger has moved into fourth. Bootsen is fifth. Nelson Piquet has come back to sixth after he had trouble earlier that had him as far back as 14th. Taking a look at the attrition in the race. Nakayama, the first car out in the very first series of turns. Campos lost his machine with mechanical problems. Then Coffey's car also fell by the wayside in the Alfa Alpha Romeo. It was Capelli, Fabi, Brundle also suffering problems in the first part of this race. Some thoughts from Chris Economaki about what we have seen thus far. It's surprising the two of the top teams have had trouble on one of their cars. Lotus with Nakajima crashing on the first lap, and McLaren with Johansson spending a lot of time in the pits changing the black box, as they call the engine control unit. But right now, the interest is focused on the key pit stops coming up shortly, where the tires will be changed, and it's here where the pit men can give their man a leg up on the rival. And the there you see the, there you see the leader, Nigel Mansell, with the race summary showing now 30 laps complete, and there has been but one leader, this man, Nigel Mansell, averaging 84.6 miles per hour. But the gap between N. Mansell, Esquire of Birmingham, England, and your actual Ayrton Senna has come down to 15 seconds. It was up to close to 20, it's now down to 15. It's still a long way, 15 seconds in Grand Prix racing, but he is closing the gap. The teammate to Nigel Mansell, Nelson Piquet, has now pulled himself into the fifth position. He's moved around Thierry Bootsen, and Nelson Piquet is on the move. Nelson Pickett is definitely on the move. He is now about 17 seconds behind Alan Prost, who is lying third in this race. Tremendous drama here in Detroit today. Prost going for his 28th win, trying to break the mark of 27, with which he's tied Jackie Stewart's mark. He finished 73. He's now in his 110th race. Stewart did his in 99. But you have to go back to people like Fangio, who got to race, what, eight times, seven times a year, and had 24 victories? 
Yes, now they have a lot of races there. We've seen Nelson Piquet. Cheeky looking chap, isn't he? 16 laying down, events. Laying down a lot of rubber on this track. Digging a few holes in it too. See, you can see where they're digging the asphalt up there in a couple of spots. Now that part of the new paving, about 20% of the track has been paved and directly in front of us. This morning, it had lasted through a Trans Am race yesterday. It had gone through all the practice. The surface was great. It rained intensely this morning. They came out, and the traffic began to tear up a part of the 20th turn on the course. We're also seeing it break up on the other side as well a bit. It, it doesn't look too bad yet, but you can see where they're putting an awful lot of rubber down. And at the next, the next corner, I was going to say, where Nelson's about to go around, you can really see a uh, new surface, mixing oil and water together, potential for ripping the surface. And, uh, well, there, like there you can see a good description of how much rubber they're putting down the road. Those two lovely black marks out of that turn four. There's the two. Senna now has the fastest lap in the race at 142.4. Ercon Senna is turning up the wick. He's going for it. He has also closed another two seconds up on the leader. <laughs> There's Dr. Jonathan Palmer and Streff going at it. Streff falling back. Ninth and tenth, I would think, on the field. Oh, that's, that's eight. No, I think Jonathan Palmer, Jonathan Palmer's a long way down because he stopped in the pits for some time. Indeed, he, he did. But they are both back on the track now, yeah. These are the two people that were really hoping for rain, actually, because they've got the normally aspirated engines. Uh, Jonathan Palmer's in actual 15th spot. There we see Senna coming up to pass one of the data general cars. That's number four. Strap. Diving down underneath the highway. Headed for the Atwater Tunnel. The restaurant had a very tricky turn. They come up just before this tunnel. Five of them spun there this morning in the wet. Here comes Senna. And they're always for the leader. You go into that gloom. It's not so bad today because it's a pretty gloomy day anyway. But um, it is a very different light in there to what it is out here. Ayrton Senna, 27 years old, divorced. One thing in mind, the world championship, breaking all the records. Mind you, Fangio in many ways, very quiet, tremendous driver. Quiet, but pretty tough. And has that dominating factor that you hear so much about. I mean, he wants it his way and no other. Single-minded to the point of excluding absolutely everything else from his life, private or business. Uh, just tunnel vision completely from Grand Prix racing uh, to win the World Championship, which is what he wants to do more than anything else in the world. He lies second on the field, clearing out traffic as he heads down Congress. Coming up from Larned here on Beaubien, now on the Larned Street, underneath the Omni Hotel in Detroit. Live pictures today on CBS from the Detroit Grand Prix. Lapping Palmer. The average, the average speed of this race is creeping up now. We're up to 84.89, which is just a tick for what's away from the uh, overall race record. There's the leader. Coming down to that very tricky first gear, 4.89, which is just a tick for what's away from the uh, overall race record. There's the leader. Coming down to that very tricky first gear, hairpin. You listen now. Two, three, four, five. And then back down to them all again to turn right. They're set up in the same place. Same engine. He may use a slightly different gear configuration. It depends on the car handling in the way he likes to drive it. And there's just no room to move your feet down inside these cockpits. You, you think about shifting gears and you think about American cars, that is not the case here. No, no, they just uh, little pedals which they really can just move their feet at the ankle. And obviously, you don't move from the knee at all. To change about gear. as big as a teaspoon. Yeah, very and small. And the steering wheels. If you're very small there, steering wheel, of course. Watching on television, just hold your hands a foot apart. Yeah. One foot apart. Now move them to 10 inches apart. And the other thing, of course, is the gear shift. When I talk about 3,000 gear shifts, people imagine it with an ordinary car with a big stick shift. Of course, the gear shift on this thing is only about two inches long, and the movement is absolutely minute. It's just a, a twist of the wrist. I mean, you don't move your arm at all. Well, if you can imagine a steering wheel that's 10 inches wide, capable of maintaining your equilibrium in a car at 180, 200 miles an hour. Well, you can imagine what these people do with these Formula One cars. We'll return with more live flag-to-flag -flag coverage of the Detroit Grand Prix after this word from your local station. 
The lead's down to 10 seconds. Nigel Mansell leading. Ayrton Senna second. Alain Prost third. Gerhard Berger fourth. PK maintaining fifth. And we are up to the point of pit stops in the race. It's expected that these cars would make one pit stop today. They'll be coming in for four tires, and Nigel Mansell looks like he may have run out of rubber on that lead car. He may pit this time. We note that his pit crew seems to be ready to do business as he comes through this last corner here, off that water. Yep, here he, here he comes, comes, and he is pitting. Leader is coming in, and here's Chris Economaki. Uh, Nigel Mansell comes into the pits. His 20-second lead is evaporating to 11 seconds. The car goes up on the jacks. There are 14 men in this pit working on the car. Mansell is cleaning his visor. They're having trouble with the right rear. They're having difficulty getting the right rear tire off. The nut won't come off. Ah, oh, this has got it. This is killing. Mansell is looking in the mirror. There he goes. And let's see. And it fits up. 18 seconds. Double the length of a normal Formula One pit stop. A break for Ayrton Senna. Back to you, Ken. Senna is first, Chris. Mansell. Prost is second. second. Prost is second. Berger to third. And there's Senna, the new leader. Seeking that sixth win and trying to become the first man in history to win this race twice and do it back to back. Ayrton Senna of Brazil in front. Nigel Mansell sorting his car out and getting it back underway. See the problem. As Chris Economaki was explaining it to you, right rear had trouble with the wheel. They usually make that stop in eight or nine seconds. Not to be this afternoon. Senna's crew getting ready, and there they are, waiting. Peter Warren coming, expecting this man to come in probably this time by. Well, I'm sure he might just go on and try and consolidate his lead while uh, Nigel's on his brand new tires, but he'll probably come in now. He's seen the lie of the land. Oh, Mr. Gear there. Mr. Gear coming under the tunnel there. Let's hope that didn't do any damage to the insides. Here's Chris. We have the nut off the right rear tire of Nigel Mansell's car. It's red hot. It's, perhaps you can see the, the threads are stripped inside the nut. It cost him about nine seconds, but more than that, it may cost him the race and possibly the world championship. Back to you, Ken. Waiting on Senna. Senna did not come in. Senna went past the start finish line again, and I've just got to watch on his lead. Um, obviously, if he can maintain a good lead here, and they do a good stop. He's got a 22-second lead over Nigel Mansell, and they can make their pit stops in less than 22 seconds. However, of course, the pit stop itself is only part of the story. You've obviously got to slow down and speed up. But that's a pretty good lead to have. Now, the other factor here is Alain Prost, who stays right in the mix here, in second place, Mansell back to third, and he didn't stop either on that lap. Alan Frost is usually pretty easy on his tyres. He's remarkable on him. And he's obviously going to become a factor in this race now. Here's Senna. Leading. Laps complete now, 35. 35 of the 64. Cheever is back to 8th position overall. U.S. entry, Eddie Cheever back to 8th. That was a pity that he and Tio Fabi had that little bash together early on because both of those cars look very competitive and could have been strong runners in this field. There we see uh, Ed Senna, the leader, coming down the Atwater Tunnel. Yeah, shift worked okay that time, so obviously it wasn't a shift problem. He obviously just made a slight mistake on that previous lap. Let's see if he comes in this lap. Coming up to the pit entry. Uh, is he running fast? No, he's going to go for another lap. He is going for still another lap as he's stretching the, the range on this Lotus Honda-powered car to the very limits. We'll be back with more from Detroit shortly. Ayrton Senna has completed 37 laps, 92 and a half miles, and has yet to pit. He's trying to make this into an economy run. There's so much computer work with these cars these days, they probably have a right down to the nickel as to exactly...
exactly what the range of this car well they do have a computer readout in the car that tells you exactly how you're going up on down on what your schedule is your fuel schedule so you can turn the boost up a little bit if you're running ahead of schedule or you have to turn it down and slow down it gives you the exact mileage you've got left in the fuel in the car he's now got a 21 second lead over nigel mansell nigel mansell's overtaken this man alan prost who is now running in third spot and i would imagine as a result of that alan prost will probably hit on this lap there's mansell coming up to the puncher train hotel turning left they're going to go down the uh under the compress hall by the front of the Cobo Hall. Just turned the uh, fastest lap in the race. The new fastest lap is Mansell's at 1 minute 40.5 seconds, about 89 and a half mile an hour average around this two and a half mile, 20 turn course. Quicker than anybody else but himself qualified, in fact, for this race. So to do a qualifying speed in the race with these turbo cars is really pretty extraordinary. He must be really pulling it all out fighting the wheel a bit here. Here comes Senna. Alan Frost didn't stop either. As an aside, as we see at the end, Senna coming up into the Congress Hall, going over the Chrysler Freeway there on that big concrete bridge. Coming up through the trees. The road here meanders a little bit. They just sort of drive straight across both apexes. A sharp left here and stay in the same gear as they come around here onto Larnard Street, which is pretty bumpy, which is where we see so many sparks normally. A lot of animal coverage there. The victory by Senna at Monaco, the last race out, was his first victory in that computer-activated suspension Lotus Honda. And prior to Monaco, Ayrton Senna's last win was right here in the streets of Detroit, as you saw it on CBS. Here he is by Cobo Hall, Ayrton Senna, now reaching out toward 39 laps. Gets the uh, range up to 97 and a half miles. His tires certainly look all right. When you see these close-up shots, you don't see any graining. You don't see any sign, telltale signs of blistering. They look pretty good. Of course, they wouldn't look good from the safety of the commentary box. Everything looks pretty good from in here. Well, let's, see if, let's see if he's going to take a gamble here, David, and bring it in. Doesn't look like it. Going again for another lap. Maybe he's going to try and do the whole race. There's no question that Formula One racing has taken advantage of computer advancements in recent years, and nowhere is that more evident than along Pitt Road, where Chris Economaki is standing. Years ago, a mechanic opened the trunk of his car, took out his toolbox, his stopwatch, a crowbar and a sledgehammer, and he was ready to work in the pits in an auto race. Not so today, thanks to the 1969 moonshot, that led to the use of mini computers, electronic sensors, and telemetry on today's sophisticated racing cars. Today's Formula One car is as complex as a spacecraft. Electronic engine management systems that measure, prescribe, and correct a myriad of engine functions. Valve timing, oil, water, and cylinder head temperatures, valve openings, ignition timing, and a host of other goings on inside these siren-sounding thousand horsepower power plants are found on all the turbocharged entries here. When a car visits the pits after a practice run, the data collected by the engine management system is offloaded into a portable computer, where it is then taken to a trackside mainframe unit where elaborate graphs and charts are printed out. This is one of two Honda installations here, one for each of the teams that furnishes engines. 45 Honda technicians travel the entire worldwide circuit tending this equipment. In the case of the Porsche TAG-powered McLarens, the offloaded data is rushed to an innocuous-looking off-limits motorhome containing a sophisticated mainframe computer where precise corrections in engine performance can be achieved. Not so, though, for the Ford engine Benetton team, which uses the new Ford EC unit that radios key data back to the pits while the car is circling the track at speed. It's telemetry and is akin to our spacecraft feeding data back to NASA on its way into the ozone. Having the data at hand immediately gives this team a leg up on all others who have to wait until their car ends the practice session before the data can be analyzed. A long way from the toolbox, the crowbar, and the sledgehammer. Thank you, Chris. Alain Frost has pitted and returned to the Detroit Grand Prix. Nigel Mansell they are now saying maybe 
sustaining some engine problems. Remember, he turned that incredibly quick lap, 140.5. He's losing ground fast. He lost uh, four seconds on that one lap. He's now 33 seconds behind the leader and will be falling back into the clutches of Alan Prost very shortly. Then Nigel Mansell. Apparently rupturing something in that engine as he tried desperately to get back into this race. Sounds all right. Here's what it and it's really socked the wall. That, that is a uh, Benetton, is it not? No, that's the uh, car of, uh, uh, yes, who is that the car of? Alio, well, it's Philip Alio, Alio's yes. car. The Lola Formula 5000. Philip Alio, and he is now out of the race. That is the number 30 car of Alio, who had been running in 11th position. Uh, very funny about putting numbers on Formula One cars. They've got so much writing on them, they've got room for the numbers. Here comes Ayrton and Senna again, still not stopping. Better this than this probably won't three. have to bother to stop. <laughs> Nelson Piquet is now closing on Cross as they battle for second position. We'll be back with more in a moment. Cannon Greater Hartford Open starting next Saturday, 2.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific, right here on CBS Sports. Oh, my God, look at that pass of Nelson Bike. My goodness me, some of the most ducking and diving we've seen all afternoon as they got held up in the chicane by the two normally aspirated cars, and that just gave Nelson Piquet the opening he was looking for, and the extra power of that Honda lurched him past the car of Alan Prost as they went down the front straight here, but it all looked pretty dodgy to me. I mean, a lot of ducking and weaving going on. The standings with that pass, Ayrton Senna first. Nigel Mansell is second. PK, his teammate, is third. Prost is fourth. Berger fifth. Terry Boosen sixth. PK, third position, having come from dead last. We saw him pull out at the end of the, the second lap with that pump journey. He pulled in to join, absolutely dead last, and he's now in a good, solid third spot. Not too far behind the leader, either. Nelson PK, then number one, Prost. World champion gets to run that number. And for the last two years, it has been the property of Prost, and but for a half point, a year back of that, when he lost it to Nicky Lauda, he'd have been world champion three times. Had half points in Monaco that year, and that's what cost him. Yes, there'll be no half points given today. We're uh, obviously not going to rain, and hopefully we won't get any cataclysmic action that's going to halt this race. Averaging... Now, 85 miles per hour, 84.9, the old mark, 85.422 currently, so we could be on our way to a new record for Detroit. Here's Chris Economaki. Formula One racing is perhaps the most political and in many cases the most devious of all of motorsport. And it wouldn't surprise this reporter to see Ayrton Senna stay out all day long on those tires. We just checked with Goodyear if they had a tire that would go all the way. And they said, we have a tire that won't wear out before the checkered flag waves, but it will be slippery and hard to handle. But with the kind of lead Senna has, I think he's going to go all the way on these tires. I could be wrong, but I got a feeling that's what the way it's going to be. Back to you. 42 of the 64, 43 of the 64 laps are now complete. All the cars are running on the same tire this year. They're all Goodyear shod, whereas before we had as many as four or five different tire brands. Oh, some fell by the wayside, and they've elected to go. Actually, it simplified things. They're on one compound all the way across for each of the machines in the event. And uh, as we see some of this gigantic crowd out for today, they bring, what, 1,600, 1,700 tires at $300 a copy? They get through a lot of tires. Now, looking at those tires on on uh, Ayrton's car, that uh, left front tire looks to me to be uh, showing some signs of wear, though. Now, uh, Nigel Mansell is now 36 seconds behind this car, so even with his old tires and Nigel with his new tires, Ayrton Senna is still pulling away at about a second, second and a half a lap. Sixth place car is in the pits. That's Terry Bootson, Tyrrell Ford, or uh, rather the uh, Benetton Ford. There we and see one of the Leisure Megatron the car coming out. 
Our news number 25, the Liger, now powered with the Megatron engine, comes back on the track. The Detroit River is the scene of the action today. It's live on CBS, the Detroit Grand Prix. More in a moment. By Quaker State, reaching for the best. Taking a look at what happened here as we came to the halfway point of the event. Nigel Mansell was then out in front at halfway. He had led from the very outset. Ayrton Senna was second. Prost was in third, Berger was in fourth, PK was fifth, and Bootson was sixth. But it was just a lap or two later that into the pits came the Nigel Mansell car and Ayrton Senna now has better than a 30-second advantage over Mansell. Nelson PK has now moved around Prost, relegating him to fourth. Gerhard Berger has found himself fifth. Bootson had been running in sixth position. The attrition in the event. Nakayama, who had a perfect record, the only driver to do so, 100% in all four previous races this year, did not complete the first lap before he crashed his Williams Honda. Campos, Coffey, Fabi, Capelli, Brundle, also falling by the wayside in this Detroit Grand Prix. De Cesare is now out, Derek Warwick, Nanini, that brilliant new star, and Michele Alboreto. Here's Dave Despain, a tire off one car. That's one of the uh, data general street, uh, that's in fact, is Philip Street's car. What a shame he was leading the uh, normally aspirated division. Running in sixth position as Street just had moved into six one lap ago. And the right rear tire becomes disengaged and rolls down the main straightaway. Well, that's unfortunate for Ken Tyrrell and company. They have two divisions of Formula One this year, the turbos and then the normally aspirated. And Streif, who is running for the Jimmy Clark Cup and Colin Chapman Cup as well for his team, for Team Tyrrell, have problems that are going to take them out of the event. We now have 47 laps complete. Only two men have shared the lead thus far. That's Mansell and Senna. As we watch the action continue here on Congress Street for a moment, Ayrton Senna has the advantage, and Chris Economaki has posed the question whether or not Ayrton Senna plans to go the entire distance without a pit stop. Well, I would think that unless he feels the car starting to behave extraordinarily difficult, he would not come in now. The tires look all right, and that shot there, you can't see any graining in particular. Obviously, we can't see what he can see or feel. Uh, but. At this stage, I think he'd stay out, but he's got a pretty healthy lead. He'd be stopped now. I'm sure he'd get in and out and still retain the lead. He's got about a 38-second lead. Senna could become the first driver to ever win this two times, this Detroit Grand Prix. Dave Despain has a report on whether or not he's coming in. That is a secret, Ken. With all the computer technology and all the talk that we've had today of communication between the race cars and those black boxes back behind the walls, all the headsets, all the technology, the only man who knows when and if Ayrton Senna is coming in is Ayrton Senna. The decision has been made to let him run as long as he wants to, as long as the car feels comfortable. And certainly they are advising him of that lead, which is growing, which will make him more comfortable. The moment he feels that the, tire, the car is in need of tires, he will signal old-fashioned style by waving to the team as he comes by the pits. And then will make his pit stop. As David Hobbs points out, he can now get in and out of the pits with fresh tires and maintain the lead. And that may well be the story of this Detroit Grand Prix. Ken? Thank you, David. Here's Senna, still in front, for better than 34 seconds. We can see, I believe, what happened to the Streff car here at the chicane that created this incident a moment ago where the tire separated from the car. Here's the chicane. Here's the car coming up now. Oh, the wheel nut. The wheel nut came off. You can yeah. see it. Oh, well, that's handy. And there's the old wheel nut coming right off the machine. Yeah. And then it was have all to take away. it back to the man at the garage and tell him to tie it up next time. <laughs> there's the car resting down in turn number one. Went all down the straightaway, came to a halt just at the entrance of turn one. So there are now 47 of 64 laps complete. More from Detroit shortly. 15 laps to go on our live coverage of the Detroit Grand Prix as Ayrton Senna of Brazil with a Williams Honda stays first. Nigel Mansell with the, with the uh, rather Lotus Honda in first. Nigel Mansell with a Williams Honda in second. Nelson Piquet is third. Alain Prost in the McLaren is fourth. And Gerhard Berger lies fifth in the Ferrari. 
Here's the leader, Ayrton Senna, maintaining the first position and has a tremendous lead now over Nigel Mansell in second. He's got over a 52-second lead. There we see Alan Prost, car number one, the tag McLaren. Having a good run, but not the sort of run that he likes. He's in fourth spot at the moment. He's about to be pressured, we feel, by Gerhard Berger in the Ferrari. 13 cars remain in the lead lap, David. And six, uh, 13 cars remain in competition and six cars in the lead lap. It's been a pretty close fight one way or another. Alan Prost looking pretty cool and calm as he goes under the Atwater Tunnel there. There we see the leader. His tyres still look pretty good from here. The, the right front seats have got a bit of a black rim around the middle of it. I don't know whether that's a bit of extra wear or some, a bit of scuffing. He, he obviously has got the whole situation under control. Though. It's been a full week of activity here in Detroit for the Grand Prix, including almost a daily sequence of parties and festivities. It kicked off Wednesday night with a black tie Grand Prix ball at the Renaissance Center. Then there was the fundraiser for the Music Hall Center for Performing Arts as part of the Grand Prix week. On Thursday, it was press night, and the setting was unique. The Henry Ford Museum, which houses a living museum of mechanized transportation. And then Friday and Saturday, downtown party, Renaissance Center. 3,500 partygoers here, and outside there was another 25 or 30,000. It was just amazing. The party continues today, and for that, Here's Chris. Well, with this being Motown, Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors all have hospitality areas here. And uh, I'm in the Chevrolet suite by the Western Hotel, enjoying some fresh fruit. The business of the automobile, selling automobiles isn't quite as good this year as it was last year, so the wine is domestic rather than imported. But everyone seems to be having a great time here. He always finds one. He always finds one, but I see they must be really on hard times. They've got plastic cups now. Stand by for an important report. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. We'll Here's see. Ayrton Senna, still in the front position. 57 seconds in front of Ann Mansell from England, who in turn is eight seconds in front of Nelson Pickett from Brazil, his teammate. There we see PK, those little vortexes coming up the end of the wing of the atmosphere here. Very humid today, 95% humidity as the race started. Really gets bashed around by those big wings. And behind PK, in fourth is Prost, fifth is Berger, sixth is Eddie Cheever. They are all running in the same lap. There are now some 50 of the 64 laps complete. You see Kinzani at this moment flashing around this two and a half mile 20 turn track. We'll return with more live flag to flag coverage of the Detroit Grand Prix after this word from your local station. Here's Eddie Cheever, the persistent one, running in sixth position, now being shown one lap down, five cars in the lead lap as we get in the waning moments of this event. And Eddie Cheever running in sixth, ready to score points for the Eros team with the Megatron engine. There is Eddie Cheever. Originally from Phoenix, Arizona, but has lived most of his life in Europe. About to go two laps down because there, just behind him, that little speck was there in center. Eddie Chiva had a very good race today, and it's a pity he had that little contretemps with Tio Fabi earlier on because I feel sure that he'd be running in front of Alan Pross at the moment. Fabi's teammate, Thierry Bootsen, in seventh place, you saw there going into turn number one with that Benetton Ford. Here's Chiva. mentioned earlier his best finish to date in a formula one race was here back in 1982 when he finally wound up in second and here's our leader trying to lap him senna boy talk about strategy senna has really pulled one off here today absolutely nigel will be kicking himself he went and changed his tires that's for sure but of course he did go off a lot faster at the beginning of the race and maybe He's paying the price of that extra speed at the beginning of the race. Senna let him go. I mean, Senna was at one stage 25 seconds behind, and then he gradually started to wind him in, and of course his tyres are still looking pretty good. Nigel Mansell put his hand out of the cockpit as he went by there. His teammate, PK, coming up beside him, going think, down to turn one. I think we'll find that PK is now in second spot, which is not a bad run from dead last. Here is Senna. 
just motoring around now with a comfortable lead. Able to stay secure in first place. He's got nearly a minute lead. Well, he's got over a minute lead now. The story is between the two Williams cars in second and third place. We'll be back to check on what's happening with Nelson Piquet and Nigel Mansell here in the Detroit Grand Prix following these words. Focusing on for the moment, it is Nelson Piquet in number six, up to second. Nelson Piquet's had a fantastic afternoon. He'll be kicking himself. He had that puncture on the first lap, obviously not his fault. Dropped to absolutely dead last, just pulled back entirely through the field and took second away from his teammate, Nigel Mansell, right in front of the commentary box. Nigel Mansell obviously running for some sort of mechanical problem. Alan Brock, there we see Nelson Piquet going down the front stretch there, into turn one. This would be Piquet's first win of the year. Nelson Piquet had a couple of seconds back in Brazil at the outset, and the last time out at Monaco, he finished in second place. Meanwhile, there's the leader, Ayrton Senna, with a minute advantage over second place man Piquet. And Senna now able to really not cruise, there's only eight laps to go but he's got to keep his wits about him, but he's got a very relatively easy run home now uh, with a minute and five second lead. However, that's not to say that things can't go wrong. And Prost has moved into third position as Mansell is sliding down the ladder. Prost into third, Mansell fourth, Berger fifth, Cheever in six. Senna continuing to lead. And so it appears now that we will have our first repeat winner in the history of the Detroit Grand Prix. At this time, oh, Thierry Bootson's coming in with a uh, flat tire, I'd say, right flat tire, left front wheels up in the air. That's the seventh place car, Bootson just coming out of pit road. I think then there we see him coming into the pits. Ayrton Senna in front, won this event a year ago. Nelson Piquet currently in the second position, won it in 1984. And he won it by the closest margin the race has been won by some seven and seven ten seconds actually there was one closer finish but then the finish was disallowed when the Tyrrell finished less than a second back and that race was taken off the books they said there was something to miss on the Tyrrell car and that was the Martin Brundle normally aspirated uh, Tyrrell both had a reasonable run today but Palmer had a problem and then of course we saw the wheel come off Phillips Street Tyrrell when he was leading that class that division there we see our leader cruising around this is the time of course when you worry absolutely most of all. Nigel Mansell's just gone past here. You can't see him, but he's about to fall into the clutches of Gerhard Berger. There we see him coming through the... Uh, under the Civic Centre Drive. Into the tunnel. Tires still look OK. Really short shifting now, you can hear that. He's shifting gear, not letting the engine rev at all. He's not taking any chances for that Honda engine. Mind you, this Honda engine and all four of these cars today have a new specification known as the GE2 step, which will revise combustion chambers, which give them better thrust response and fuel consumption, which certainly seems to work this afternoon. Sounds like a dance, and in that case, it would yes. be a waltz for Ayrton Senna here today as he continues to lead down for the finish shortly. Nigel Mansell badly off form in the final moments here, running very slowly down Larned Street and has fallen back three positions since we left. No doubt a very distressed Nigel Mansell. He has the absolute class of the field, set the pole as fastest in every practice session, and set a very, very comfortable pole position and shot off to a very, very commanding lead. But unfortunately, that all fell away and he's now dropped back to fifth. He's obviously got some sort of mechanical malfunction. Here are the top five. Ayrton Senna, first. Looks like he's going to win it for the second year in a row. PK, second. Frost is third. Berger is fourth. And Nigel Mansell has a grip, but not a very strong one, on fifth position. Well, I think he's Washington probably good all right on fifth, because uh, Eddie Cheever is sixth, is a lap down. Um, I don't think he'll unlap himself in two more laps. I'd be more concerned about the car finishing at this Well, point. at this stage, I would be very concerned about it. He must be really nursing at home. There we see him. The leader's getting really cheeky now. He's waving, waving to the crowd or the cameraman. And this with 57 complete. I was so glad to read a report the other day that Nelson, that Ayrton Senna, who presents such a dour face to the world, is in fact incredibly human as he was arrested outside a bar in Monaco at 4 o'clock in the morning after his win at Monte Carlo. So he's obviously very human after all. 
There's the battle that's taking place for second place. You saw PK's car, and here is Prost about two and three quarters of a second back from him. To Cobo Hall they go. He looks pretty strongly positioned, I don't know. Prost won't give up, of course. That's one thing about this man. There's the uh, Nelson PK going under the tunnel, and here comes Alan Prost, not far behind him. trickle down. Senna seems to be on his way. He threw everyone a curve here today. The estimate had been that lap 33, 34 would be the mark. You see those large frames. They cars up and they've had to use them fairly frequently through the weekend and the practice periods. Just lift them over the wall to keep the event going. With five laps to go, Frost is in third position. Down into turn number one, he travels in the McLaren tag. Well, if the race was to stop now and Senna was to win it and Prost was to finish where he is currently in third spot, that would change the world championship positions and Ayrton Senna would take the lead with 24 points and Alain Prost would drop to second with 21. And Nelson Pickett would move up to uh, third spot with um, 18 points. Nelson still in second place. Remember that Chris predicted earlier that it might be flag to flag without nary a stop. And that's what Senna is trying to do right now. Senna Under has five. done it. And, of course, so has uh, Nelson Piquet. He changed that one tire, of course, which was, uh, had a puncture. Four laps to go for Ayrton Senna. Four to go. If you lose it here, you would really feel miserable. He would feel incredibly miffed, to say the least. Driving very steadily now, very carefully. But still setting a pretty cracking average speed at 50 laps. It was 85, nearly, nearly 86 miles an hour. New record for sure for speed here today in the Detroit Grand Prix. As the young Brazilian Ayrton Senna, who came up out of the karting ranks. That's where so many of these people get their initial try. Yesterday in the Trans Am competition here in Detroit, we saw Scott Pruitt victorious in a Mercure over the Porsche of Elliott Forbes Robinson. A lot of people say Scott Pruitt has the talent to go on to Formula One. Well, he certainly is a very talented young guy. He drives very forcefully, very hard, and usually pretty safely, too. I think he could well go far in racing. Here is Senna, who they say in years to come will be the man to reckon with for world title honors. has still some minute on the second place man. The Brazilian congregation here, down toward turn number one, cheering him on. Well, having a good day today, because at the moment, Brazil lies first and second. Brazil one and two, the rest nowhere. They so won the world title four times with Fittipaldi and then with Nelson Piquet. And this is the Brazilian they're banking on to do it again in 1987, and he could take the point lead this afternoon based upon the incredible performance here. One of those flag poles is an interesting one. As we walked up today, it was made out of beer steins. <laughs> they picked up these plastic steins, had them about 25 high, marching around, carrying the Brazilian colors. With three to go, Ayrton Senna continues to have this handsome lead over countryman Nelson Piquet in second and defending world champion Alain Prost in third. Well, the, the active suspension certainly seems to have paid up today. Eh? It's allowed him to certainly at this stage look like winning a race on the very bumpy, twisty streets of uh, Detroit. Plus, of course, added to that, he's had great tire wear too. So the suspension system seems to be working out and I'm sure they'll improve it a lot yet. 45 people from Japan just here monitor the efforts made by the Honda engines in this race. And then there's another whole set that are working on that on that new active suspension unit. And the next race is coming up too will probably also play into Honda's hands because they're high speed circuits and there's no doubt about it, the Honda engine is the most powerful. Of course they're rapidly moving toward a time when turbos will be a thing of the past in Formula One. And of course, the idea being to try and make it a bit cheaper, but of course there'll be so much sophistication put into the normally aspirated engines that we're going to see some pretty exotic engines giving tremendous horsepower without the aid of turbochargers. Ron Dennis says without turbochargers, they will become just as expensive, and his old partner, John Bernard, now at, at uh, Ferrari, says that it will be much cheaper and bring more teams into Formula One. How do you feel about it, David? 
Well, I think it might make it a little bit cheaper and it might bring some manufacturers back. It's, it's very hard to tell. The manufacturers are faced with tremendously escalating costs in Formula One, and it's just a case of desire and, and a feel if that's the way they want to market their product. Through the chicane, laps down. A sweet moment for now, uh, Ayrton Senna about to come up as he's about to put his old sparring partner in the loosest possible term, a lap down. Nigel Mansell really staying out of his way there. Giving him well plenty done. of room to go. Yeah, giving him plenty of room. <laughs> old friend of CBS. Football season coming along. You mean the Greek owns that building, Dave? He owns that building? Does indeed. I wonder what his prediction was on this race. He won it in the back. <laughs> Stefan Johansson has just moved into seventh position. Christian Donner dropping back a spot. Johansson now up to seventh. Cheever maintaining sixth. Mansell in fifth and hanging on by his fingernails. Fourth is Berger. Third is Prost. Second, PK. Up in front is Senna. Now there is Prost in the number one car. Still in third position. Putting one of the Ligier Megatron cars a lap down. They've had a pretty checkered career this year. They were going to use a new Alfa Romeo engine. Um, they passed some unfortunate remarks about the performance of the engine on Italian TV. So the Alfa Romeo said, OK, don't bother. And they had to redesign the car, and they're using the Megatron, i.e. BMW engine. Now. And it doesn't fit very well at the present time. I'm sure it'll take the balance. The only Alfa Romeo in this race was an early victim. The Sella car. Yeah. Listen to him just idling along here now. So short shift and really. grandiose finish. Here is Nelson Piquet, second man in the field, and more than willing to settle for second place after this one. At this moment, everybody driving as if they're at walking on eggshells, being very, very careful. Ayrton Senna really cruising around. In fact, I'm sure that both these guys are cruising around now. Prost is not very far behind. Nelson, but he's far enough. A lap to go. Final lap is underway. Let's follow. Ayrton Senna of Brazil as he seeks his sixth Grand Prix Formula One championship event. His second in a row, victorious at Monaco, now about to be victorious in the United States Grand Prix here in Detroit. And become the first man to repeat in this Detroit event. A well-driven, a well-calculated race for Team Lotus. I would think that Peter Warren might have had something to do in the thinking about how they were going to do this. It wasn't all in the hands of Ayrton Senna to take this camp. No, but it's a, it is a team effort. As you said, there's something like 45 people from Honda here looking after admittedly the engines for two teams. But they have vast backup crews now with the suspension systems, the bodywork, the aerodynamics, the team manager, the fuel everybody it's a, it's a very big business these engines are boxed up and they'll go right back to japan they don't go back with the team final time by kobo hall for Ayrton senna the young brazilian has shown the lotus colors new colors this year with a new sponsor since the midway point of this race just about the 33rd 34th lap he took over when nigel Mansell came into pit and that was the difference i wonder if you'll let stefan johansson go by here you certainly won't want him running into him on the last lap, that's for sure. The number two car of Johansson, the McLaren, is running in seventh position. Down for the chicane, the final time. Ayrton Senna of Brazil clears out, comes to the line, and will take the checkered flag. Senna is victorious in the United States Grand Prix, the Detroit Grand Prix for 1987. And the Brazilians are pleased about this, as is the Lotus team as they sense that indeed in Ayrton Senna they have the potential for the world title. Nelson Piquet for second place. Brazil sweeping first and second here in the United States this year at Detroit. Third spot will go to Prost. Uh, There's a Brazilian, Brazilian flag. Picking up Brazilian flag up. He had one inside the cockpit there. Ayrton Senna goes for a slightly larger variation as he takes his victory lap here on this two and a half mile, 20 turn course. And there you see the flags and that rather unique flag staff created. The flag disappeared off it somewhere during the event. So Senna has won here today. Chris Economaki will be standing by to interview this champion who has done it for the first time at Detroit twice.
We'll be back in a moment. A gentle rain is now falling just in the final moments as they came across the line here in Detroit. Ayrton Senna is now at the scales with his car. He's holding up his flag. He's out of the car for the first time. Let's go to Dave to Spain quickly. So now the rain falls, but it certainly won't spoil Ayrton Senna's parade. Peter War, team manager, you didn't want to talk late in the race, but you obviously had things well in command. Well, he had things well in command. I think he sprung a surprise on all of us today by not stopping to change for tires. And boy, did the guy drive a fantastic race, because even at the end, he was still putting in fast, fast lap times, lap after lap. You had not talked about the, the possibility of going the whole distance. No. I think he snuck up on us through that one. <laughs> He's also given you a rather nice birthday present, eh? He has indeed. Much nicer than the last one. <laughs> are, are, you, uh, are you admitting to any age here? I know you've been around this Formula One business a long time. No, but next year's going to be the big 5-0. <laughs> No one has ever won this race twice in a row. Senna has not only won it, he has absolutely scorched them. As you came here and watched Mansell run so strong through the qualifying, did you feel good about this event? Did you think you had what, it ma what, what you needed when the time came? Well, Ayrton said that he didn't think he could match Mansell's time in qualifying, so he spent the second half of the last qualifying session setting the car up for the race on full tanks, and he was as similarly quietly confident to the way he was in Monaco, so we didn't speak a lot but we felt that he might have it under control. Peter, our congratulations. We're going to hear from your driver now. Let's go to Chris Economaki at Victory Lane. Well, fine. We're here with a happy winner. Congratulations, Ayrton Senna. You surprised everybody when you didn't stop for tires. When did you make up your mind not to get tires? Sometime during the race. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. Tell us about it. Well, you had to take in consideration the pace of the race, the others of my own car, and make a decision by halfway through. And I decided to go. I decided to go for it because at the beginning of the race I took it very easy on the tires because I had some brake problems. That's what that was when I just started to pull away. My brakes started to go down. So I had to slow down a lot and automatically I saved the tires. So I had the tires to go then the race distance. You were 20 seconds down at one point. Were you worried then? You are always worried. You never know. But... <laughs> You just go for it. Now, what about the active suspension, uh, Ayrton? Did it work fine, obviously, huh? Yeah, it was good and uh, no problem. And the car worked very well. The only problem were the brakes. I had the pedal going down sometimes. And that was my only worry. And uh, then, also the tires, because we were not sure whether they could run the whole distance without blowing or having a, a problem just to, by wear, because we were supposed to stop. Uh, nobody knew I was going for it. I was the only one. So I was worried because the tires were not done for the full race distance, but they worked fantastic. I had no problem. They worked very well, and I could do the whole race distance with no problem. Well, okay. Uh, Goodyear said the tires would last at the end of the race, but they would be very slippery and hard to control. Did you have difficulty towards the end? I didn't have to push anymore. I was so far ahead that I could afford to take it easy. So that, of course, uh, was the key on the pocket be able to take it easy towards to the end. Okay, thank you very much and congratulations. One last question. Where'd the flag come from? Almost the same spot from last year. Somebody that was cheering up there during the race was there with the flag. I stopped again. Many Brazilians have flag. Okay, now we have with us the other finisher back over here. It's Alain Prost in third place. A nice drive for you, Alain. Are you happy with finishing third? Yeah, very happy. Uh, I think I could not expect much more. The handling of my car was much better than doing the practice, but uh, I had a typical problem for Detroit brakes and tires and also gearbox. And could have pushed a little bit harder at the end, but I was so happy to finish so that uh, we prefer to keep it. Nelson, a fantastic drive, a flat tire, you dead last, and you come back to finish second. Have you ever raced harder? Oh, yes. <laughs> Some other plates, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I didn't know if the tires go last. But what I done is uh, I took very easy in the beginning because I have to overtake a lot of people. I didn't have much wheel spin. And in the end, I, I give a, a very strong, but that, the problem is uh, I took too easy in the beginning. I should go hard from the beginning to the end. If you had not had the flat tire, could you have won it, Nelson? Uh, it's very difficult to say these things, you know. It's uh, if. If, if is, uh, it's impossible to say, many races I didn't win because of something. But uh, for me, it was a good result. I don't like this kind of circuit, slow circuit. I prefer the quick ones, and I 
We'll wait for the when the championship start in Europe. You'll sleep tonight, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Nelson VK. And let's go now to Ken Squire topside. It's a new record of 85.697 miles per hour, David. One hour, 15 minutes, 16 seconds by which they decided this event. And they didn't stop a second too soon because here comes the rain and they just got away with a perfectly dry race. But I think Ayrton Senna underlined today just what a thinking man he is. No tire stop for him, no tire stop for Nelson Piquet, who also must be feeling very good. He's been demoralized by his teammate Nigel Mansell the last half a season or so. And I think today would have given him a lot of help coming second, a good second. Not just a good race for Alan Prost, and he's still only level pegging with Jackie Stewart, that 28th wins yet to come. 26 starters today, 14 cars were running at the finish of the event. David, were you surprised this many cars came across the line? This is the track that usually just devours equipment. The attrition wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. There was not very many crashes, certainly no bad ones. And um, as you say, it was quite a high finishing rate because this is very tough, especially on transmissions, drive shafts, and this sort of thing. We obviously had the, the, the thing here at the uh, chicane when the wheel came off Philip Streif's car, which is pretty unfortunate. And I'm very sorry about that first lap accident between Fabi and uh, Cheever because I think that took out two really good runners and obviously I was sorry to see my friend Thierry Boots and not finish either. We'll uh, have a resume on the event shortly but for the moment let's move on to boxing which is coming up on CBS later today. We're going to Atlantic City for the moment. Here's Tim Ryan. Let's take a look at the final results here in the Detroit Grand Prix. Ayrton Senna of Brazil, the first repeat winner here, comes across the line for the Lotus Honda team. Nelson Piquet for Williams Honda is second. Then Prost finishes in third. The fourth position was Gerhard Berger and Nigel Mansell was fifth. Now let's take a look at the second five. Rounding out the point scoring drivers today, Eddie Cheever was six. Johansson gets credit for seventh. Christian Donner is eighth. Patrese is ninth. And Rene Arnoux comes across in tenth position. Well, those were the top ten here this afternoon in Detroit. Well, I think we saw some good shows this afternoon. Eddie Cheever's car looked very strong all day. It was a pity that Warwick, uh, I think he probably flipped the wall somewhere. We saw him coming with that wheel deranged. Cheever definitely would have been, I'm sure, in the top three or four if he hadn't had that stop. Fabi and Bootsen were both going very well in the Benetton Fords, and I'm looking for them to do very well as the season progresses. Eddie Cheever had a terrific finish today, and Dave Despain is with him now. These are the hands of the sixth place finisher in this race. Eddie Cheever worked for that spot here today. Blisters all over a tough racetrack to drive, Eddie. A uh, very tough racetrack. I was extremely disappointed that Fabi made the mistake he made. I mean, I'm not blaming everybody makes mistakes, but I was already committed to the corner. There's no place I could go. He just ran into the back of me. Without that, I think I would have finished in the first three. That was the consensus in the booth moments ago that you drove a brilliant race. It ended on a strange note. You didn't make it to the finish. What happened there? I, I ended I made it to the finish, but I had to run at such a high boost level the whole way to pick up time that I ran out of gas. There's something wrong with my computer. It stole too last minute, but my uh, USF and GROs ran very good today. We made it to the end of the race. It's a great disappointment only to finish sixth. I think that in the future, uh, if they are as ambitious as I am, I'm sure USF and G can give us that extra push to get right up there in the end. And I'm sure I'm sure they are as ambitious as we are, and uh, I think we can go a long way together. The consensus coming into this race was that this is the team that has improved most coming into this season. This guy gave their car a drive worth remembering here this afternoon. Congratulations, Eddie. Let's go back to Ken Squire. Congratulations indeed to Eddie Cheever and to John Schmidt and all the folks responsible with that Arrows team. Jackie Oliver, they certainly had an outstanding day. Well, what came in as the story of the hour, that business of running for the 28th win, for Alain Prost was not to be decided here today. It's still tied at 27, and for a moment, let's reflect on some of the great racing giants who have given us some great races and the records previously. The five-time world champion, Juan Manuel Fangio, with 24 wins. Back in the days, they didn't run that many times. Nicky Lauda, 25 wins, three-time world champion. Jim Clark, twice world champion, scored 25 victories and then it was Jackie Stewart who put it right up on top at 27 in 1973 and it will be another chapter of world championship Formula One racing to decide if Elaine Prost indeed will be the number one man in racing with all-time career victories at 28 or perhaps more back with some closing thoughts following these messages Detroit continues to celebrate Ayrton Senna victory here, number one in the world points. 
Yes, he's had two great wins in the streets of Monaco and here at Detroit with 85 mile an hour averages. How are they going to look in three weeks' time when they go to the open fields of Silverstone and 160 miles an hour? They look pretty good this afternoon, but those Williams looked good at Silverstone two years ago, and I think that Mr. Prost is going to look pretty good from now on, too. So that's the story from Detroit this afternoon for David Hobbs and Chris Economaki and Dave Despain. This is Ken Squire saying so long from the 1987 Detroit Grand Prix, where the winner is Brazil's Ayrton Senna. I'll be back next Sunday on CBS Sports for live flag-to-flag -flag coverage of the Michigan 400 NASCAR race. And coming up next, light heavyweight boxing plus the grueling Paris bicycle race. Stay tuned for all the action on CBS Sports. The 87 Detroit Grand Prix has been a presentation of CBS Sports. Ayrton Senna, the winner. <laughs>